Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Youth Matters, where on today's show we are discussing Muslim ban, is this uh, just a start? Now in the first segment we looked at the ban itself and some of uh, the questions that were discussed was based around how people were feeling about that. In the second segment what we want to do is look at and explore some of the concerns uh, moving forward that our youth might have about how this uh, could trigger off other potential uh, concerns uh, locally and globally. Uh, before we go back to our audience, uh, we've just had an email from a teacher referring to um, an incident that took place with another teacher who tried to go to America and uh, I'm sure uh, most people are aware of this. And the question that's been asked is, what are the panel's view on the recent story of a Welsh Muslim school teacher that was escorted off a plane uh, heading to the US? Will our politicians give us any uh, reassurances that British Muslims are protected from the ban. So um, I'll ask that question to Harim. I think politicians, um, the reaction to the Muslim ban by politician has been abysmal, for putting it straight up, straight up. The day after Theresa May was visiting um, uh, Donald Trump, um, I think it was the day after, when the ban was introduced and the ban was implemented, she had no condemnation when she was speaking mm -hmm. in Turkey with the Turkish Prime Minister. And she said that it was, pr it was America's problem, deal with it. But it was only until an Iraqi MP from the Conservative Party raised the concern of, I don't think I can go back, go to America. That's when they, they, they had some pressure. And I remember the, a few days afterwards, there was a protest outside Whitehall. I would say thousands of people came to Whitehall to protest it. And there have been politicians in terms of the Labour Party, and very, majority of the opposition, saying that this is an issue, even people within the Conservative Party. But at this moment in time, I don't think the Conservative Party will be doing much because they're under a lot of pressure right now because of Brexit. They're, they're, they feel that in order to survive Brexit and the aftermath, the economic Armageddon, as I like to call it, that will take place after Brexit, that will take place, they feel they need to have a good relationship with America. They feel that they need to have a good relationship with dictatorships sure. in Saudi Arabia and whatnot. Okay. And because of that one reason, that's why we don't think much will happen okay. unless people on the ground start mobilizing and start acting. Sure. Uh, Elaine, um, it, Theresa May, mm -hmm. uh, our um, Prime Minister, uh, there's a lot of pressure obviously there's many uh, pressures that maybe the public aren't always aware of that obviously uh, uh, being the leading lady in the country uh, she has to deal with and obviously international relations uh, with countries around the world you know that is something that is very uh, prominent in her role now do you feel that you know the prime minister is having to create uh, maintain those relationships for the betterment of this country um, what's your view on that i think she's selling out so this country is built on the values of openness, tolerance, um, and what she did when that question came up in Turkey to turn around and say, oh, it's America's problem. That's appalling. That's not something that we should be accepting. What she should have said was, I uh, don't know if it's true um, and I'll look into it. However, if that is what he's done, that's not what Britain stands for. Those aren't our values and that's not something that I'm going to put up with. And instead, she's just rolled over um, and uh, condoned his appalling conduct and then a few days later attempted to backtrack. Mm. Um, it's not good enough as a country for us to be running around acting like we're desperate and cozying up to the bully of the world purely because we may be desperate for a trade deal in a couple of years. And um, that's not what Britain for me, that's not what we're about, that's not what our values are. So and okay. um, yeah, she's been a massive disappointment. Okay. Um yeah. Um, so I really Sorry, just wait for the mic so we can hear your view properly. Yeah. Um so I think it's fair to say that we all agree that Theresa May's silent kind of apologism towards the Muslim ban is kind of is shameful. So in in response to what you were saying, um, to what extent do you think that we should be rolling out the red carpet for Donald Trump's visit to the UK soon? Okay, um, can I ask uh, Ibrahim to answer that, please? Um, obviously, you know, got to have good relations and you know get along with countries and, and all the rest of it. And obviously, it's not in his interest to like. Um, have a bad relationship per se. However, at the same time, I don't think it is you know life or death. It's, 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 I don't think it's essential that we roll out the carpet for a man like that. I think it's a far stronger message to say that you know your values are not in line with the values 
most people in this country will hold. Mm. Um, you know, people are concerned, and ultimately our government should be representing that. So obviously you are going to see, and obviously you've seen it already, the government's had to move, uh, to moving it to Birmingham, even as far north as Balmoral in Scotland, um, just to keep protesters away. So obviously the government's aware of that, and it reflects the mood, but ultimately it's a decision, you know, for us. I mean, I think, you know, the petition was excellent, the debate in Parliament was excellent, but ultimately the pressure can't, you know, we can't forget this, you know, this, this will go away, more news will come, other issues will arise. Ultimately, it has to be sustained pressure. Mm -hmm. We will not normalize it. So it has to, to be very frank, he has to be on the par of any other dictator, personally speaking. I mean, if there was any other country, if there was a Muslim ban or, or any type of ban in any other country, it would be, a, there'll be a press release, there'll be a statement, maybe sanctions, ambassadors will be recalled, ambassadors will be brought into the foreign saying, you can't do this, there'll be lectures about human rights and equality. But because the United States were so desperate, allegedly, for a trade deal, we're happy to go along with it. Uh, as the poodle maybe that Britain was once uh, in some senses. So obviously it's not on and you know I don't think so you know, he should be here. Why should he be here? I think he's been elected, got to deal with him in some way, uh, but the idea was actually to roll out the red carpet. And by the way it's historic, no other British Prime Minister has rolled out the red carpet a few weeks into a US president's term. I mean, Ronald Reagan, who was very popular back then, you know, there's a love in between him and Thatcher. It was towards the end of his term that he came here. So it clearly shows the desperation of the Conservatives in getting Brexit right. Mm. OK, thank you. Yeah. And what's your, what's your view on the pros uh, prospect of Donald Trump visiting the UK? Um, by Theresa May allowing Donald Trump to come to visit the UK, it kind of gives into this view that you can't be a Muslim uh, and you can't be so as a British Bangladeshi Muslim or a Palestinian American we're told that we are either one or the other we can't be um, we can't just be kind of a Westerner and I think by her allowing that and her lack of condemnation towards the ban kind of just gives that even more legitimacy and I think that is just shameful okay all right uh, thank you uh, Farhan you had a question uh, yeah so before we were talking about Islamophobia and how Donald Trump has given a voice to people who are is Islamophobic. So I was just wondering how like, so some people say they're protected under free speech. So I was wondering how you guys think about like where does free speech end and hate, <coughs> and hate speech begin? Like should these people be allowed to say what they're saying? And um, like are they protected under free speech or not? Okay, uh, Arif? Um, I, th I think there's a, a thin line between free speech and hate speech. Um, where, where I would say that the line is drawn is when you're purposely targeting a particular group, a particular community, and inevit inevitably inciting hatred. And we have to bear in mind that when the President of the United States says something, it means, it means something. And Donald Trump sadly hasn't got that message yet. And, and, th and I think this is something to bear in mind when hate, when speech is being used to target marginalized groups within a particular society, when speech is being used to target and belittle um, individuals who are already facing mass levels of discrimination, something has to be said. When that speech is being used as permission to then um, act, commit acts of um, hatred towards that group, then something needs to be done. And that I think that's where the line needs to be drawn. It's really interesting how in the last few days um, a gentleman called Milo Yiannopoulos, really flamboyant, blonde guy, um, a British man for that matter, not even an American citizen, going around different campuses, spewing horrific um, um, th things about Muslims, about women, about people from the LGBT community, about trans people. But then when the, uh, and everyone was like, everyone was condemning it, but then you had conservatives being like, no, this is fantastic. This is this is free speech at its finest. This is what America is. But then, when a video surfaced of him essentially condoning pedophilia and not condemning it, that was the line. And I'm thinking, why was the line not drawn when you were targeting women, when you were targeting people of color, when you were targeting Muslims, gay people? Like, what's going on there? You know. And that, for me, demonstrates that free speech has limits. People assume that free speech is this thing where you can just say anything you want. But that one episode alone demonstrates that there are limits and and who's the snowflake now, essentially? Because people who talk about, oh, we need to be you no know, platforming these people, we need to be being wary of what they're saying, whatnot, they're snowflakes, they're this or that. But all of a sudden, all these conservatives are snowflakes because now they're condemning um, this individual because he said some horrific things about um, people who get molested, mm. young, people who are underage who get molested. And, 
for me, it demonstrated a hypocrisy there, and, I, and it also demonstrated that free speech, as important as it is, also has limits, especially when it comes to belittling people who are powerless and marginalised. Okay. Farhan, what's your view on that? Um, I think uh, with the current situation with Milo and Yiannopoulos, uh, I agree. Like, some people, they draw the line differently where uh, free speech finishes and where hate speech ends. And I think if you are targeting anyone for, like, a personal gain to, like, just get rid of some, like, a certain group of people, then that is hate speech, essentially. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elaine, we've got another email, and uh, I want to ask you to answer this particular question. It says, uh, uh, Donald Trump said fake news is the enemy of the state recently. Um, did he not use fake news to win the election? Uh, hugely. Um, so fake news to Donald now is uh, anything where it doesn't agree with his world view. So that's why he's banned CNN, BuzzFeed, BBC and other various news outlets. Um, you've also had things like Sean Spicer, his press secretary, um, coming out against Saturday Night Live and saying that they're being really mean to them. Um, so it is a... It, this is what happens when uh, people with Trump's uh, worldview and personality trait of he thinks that he is right on absolutely everything and if you disagree with him it's not that you have a different perspective it's that you're you're <coughs> lying um, and if you're not feeding his propaganda machine then you're not allowed into into the White House essentially <laughs> um, and I think I'm not sure it was fake news that he used to win the election I think can we come back to was, that yeah. point um, because we've got a caller on the line yeah. thank you Elaine. Uh, Salaam alaikum caller Hello, Kola. Hello, Kola. Hello, Salam. Uh, how would you like to contribute towards the discussion? Okay, I was just um, watching your program. I, my question is uh, to the youth in the audience. I want to know what their views are and how they feel about this new Muslim ban. Because it'd be nice to hear um, the youth, um, how they feel. I think um, mm. sometimes we kind of don't... Um, pay attention to their feelings as, uh, as adults talking, but I think I, I, it'd be interesting to know how the youth feel about this whole Muslim yes. ban done by the Tron Trump. Please, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, um, so who would like to respond to that? Okay. Kausa, do you want to, what's your view on that? Sorry, can we get the mic to Kausa, please? As a young Muslim, I don't think I should really get involved in this stuff. But that's my own personal view because I think, well, the way that I look at it is, I think this guy's nuts. Let, let him do what he wants. Either way, Allah says in the Quran that they will plan, but Allah is the best of planners. So they can plan as much as they want to get rid of Islam. But as Muslims, we know Islam will always be there. Mm, okay, and uh, yeah. Okay, I agree. With, I get where you're coming from, but at the same time, I would say that if you are um, a Muslim, at the same time, if you have political tools at your disposal, if you have, you know, um, people that you can get the message out to, mobilize protests, wherever, I do believe it's our duty to speak out against injustice because that is another thing that Islam preaches. Um, so at the same time, whereas yeah, it does say in the Quran that Allah is the best of planners. Um, we also, it's, it's also a Muslim's duty to um, speak out against oppression in yeah. whatever form it may be. Um, in response to the question, I think that the caller asked, um, I think a lot of Muslim women in the audience as well would say that um, we feel more watched or policed, I guess, um, even by members of the public, um, random, you know, Islamophobic incidents that may happen, they've increased in number um, and we felt on a personal level, so even speaking to friends, family, they've all had, you know, people either not sitting next to them on the tube, shouting something, um, maybe saying something really offensive, Islamophobic. So I think we could say that it has definitely, there's been a spike in uh, personal incidents as well. But have you have you also seen the opposite side to um, you know all of this, where people have actually become much more understanding, appreciative, more considerate, because you know uh, has and the question that we ask, where has it united us, where people are starting to actually think, you know. Uh, that we need to do much more in our local community. Sarah, what do you think? Um, yeah, I definitely do believe, like, as a result of the ban, people have, like, come in unity. Like, for example, I was speaking to one of my American friends the other day, and she was mentioning the tension and, like, the change in atmosphere since he's been elected. 
Uh, but she told me an example where she was receiving harassment on the train and then um, two black men, they came all the way from the back of the train just to see if she was okay and if she was, like nobody was speaking to her, nobody was helping her and they walked her all the way home because that one man, he was a white male, he was uh, shouting abuse at her. So I think in one sense it has united people together um, against racism and against his crazy rhetoric. So yeah. Okay, and since you've got the mic, um, do you want to ask your second question? But yeah. um, my second question, it was just in relation again to um, the fact that why hasn't Trump banned uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia? What incentives do they provide for Trump? Um, so it's basically similar linked to the first question. Okay. Uh, Arim? So um, th I think it's something that's not really been spoken about in terms of why Trump hasn't banned individuals from Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and whatnot. I can speak specifically about Saudi Arabia. I think a key um, aspect of it all. Um, so when Trump was running for election, he was talking about the nuclear deal made with Iran and how it was a disaster, um, how it sold out American values, uh, sold out American security. And once he'd come in, one of the first things he'd like to do is either repeal that um, um, that deal or even just um, uh, amend it in some way so that it's harsher in Iran. And, I, and one, one of the interesting things when you look at the Middle East in terms of geopolitics and whatnot, there is this kind of, um, it's a bit of an exaggerated thing I'm saying right now, but in terms of kind of this kind of Cold War ideologically, but also kind of um, militarily between Saudi Arabia and Iran in terms of having influence on the region. And one could argue that one of the reasons why Donald Trump did not include Saudi Arabia in um, in this the list of seven countries was because of the fact that he needed um, Saudi Arabia on site. But something to bear in mind too: these seven countries, in terms of restrictions, it has it didn't just come out of a vacuum. Like Ibrahim was saying, in terms of the kind of previous policies from previous administrations, these seven countries were already facing stringent restrictions um, during the Obama administration, and I also believe during the Bush administration too. What um, Donald Trump simply did was essentially um, um, kind of act upon his, the existing infrastructure that does exist. Not to say that the kind of talking about Muslim ban and whatnot, that kind of ideological kind of underpinning didn't exist, because like the uh, um, speech that was shown said, he specifically spoke about banning all Muslims or mu individuals who are from the Muslim faith, from Muslim majority countries coming. And one could argue that these seven countries are the start and then it could snowball into a big, uh, bigger ban. Um, in that case, then, do you believe like Saudi Arabia, they should play uh, uh, make a, role, a bigger role than they already are now in, say, helping these seven countries? Or they should play a bigger role because they're not banned and ultimately um, that may I mean, be their responsibility? I mean, I would, yeah, to answer your question, I don't think... I, I do agree that Saudi Arabia, to a certain degree, should put pressure on America, but if I'm very frank with you, I don't think they care that much um, to be doing that. I don't think it's in their interest necessarily, for example, to be easing restrictions on Iran. If anything, they want that. Um, same with Syria, same with um, Yemen, which they're currently in a war with right now, or with groups within Yemen, rather. So um, as idealistic as it comes across in terms of like Saudi Arabia being the representative of all Muslims because they've got Makkah and Medina um, in, in their kind of borders, within their borders, I don't think they, would, they don't really care. If anything, they're more concerned about ensuring that their influence remains within, um, within, um, within the region also sure. with America. Thank you. And Sarah, what's your view on that? Um, I definitely believe Saudi Arabia, yeah, they should play a bigger role than they are now. I mean, they're not, um, no, um, there's no trouble in positions on them um, and they definitely believe I believe they have a role like as a majority uh, Muslim country in say supporting the other Muslim countries um, again like you mentioned with the uh, Yemen civil war they should instead of like uh, supporting America and um, aiding them they have a duty with the other Muslim countries to help them sure. um, and why help the refugees why do you think they're not doing more um, again for economic benefit and um, to pursue their own, to fulfill their own greed, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, um, I'll come back to you, Elaine. Um, mm. We did cut you off when the caller right. was <laughs> on the line, and we were speaking about fake mm. someone emailing in about fake news and uh, Donald Trump saying fake news is the enemy of the state, yet uh, did he not use fake news to win the election? So you were, do you want to carry on with your answer? So I don't think it was quite fake news that he used to win the election. He made particular statements that, you know, weren't true. He um, said all kinds of things during the election. 
um, and they were they were reported because it was an election, partly because it was an election campaign, and partly because I think the media couldn't quite believe what he was saying. So what we're seeing now is a change in that relationship. So we've gone from the media basically going, "We can't believe he's saying this. We're going to broadcast he's saying it." and then being shocked that he actually won the election because they were giving him wall-to-wall -wall coverage. And now doing the role that they should have been doing before, where they're now saying, actually, there's a lot of stuff he's saying that isn't true. There's a lot that doesn't make sense. There's a lot that just doesn't work. And therefore, we're going to point that out because that, that is genuinely their role. And then you've got Donald Trump kind of going, oh, hang on a minute, I don't, I don't want to play this game. It used to be that I would say something and you would report it pretty much word for word. Like the speech that you showed earlier got huge amounts of coverage in the States. And it, there was some critical coverage, but not a lot. There was a, it was far more he has said this, can anyone believe he's saying it? Mm. And so now it's a, he's disengaging from people that don't agree with him. Um, and that's really dangerous that, that we're moving into that. And that, it, you know, he's only been in office a month and we've already gotten to this point where he's banning outlets that he doesn't, he doesn't like anymore. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. Now, we're very close to the end of the second segment. Uh, do stay with us for the third segment when we will discuss um, what the future holds moving forward and what we need to do uh, as a community, old, young, to try and um, challenge it in the right way and ensure that you know justice uh, is achieved uh, globally. Uh, as always, this is a show uh, where we want you to get involved. So please, you know, the number is on the screen. Do get in touch and also email us and we will read it out here. Uh, so we'll see you uh, inshallah very shortly.